Hi everyone, welcome back to workshop and it's repair time again. And this time I've got an Agilent 3499A switch control system. And yep, it's a rack mounted pieces of equipment that probably a lot of you haven't seen before. And what this unit does is it's a GPIB controlled instrument. So the idea is you would plug in some modules into the back that would give you the ability over GPIB to control those modules, such as multiplexer modules, general purpose relay modules, matrix modules, um, high frequency switching modules, optical modules, digital IO and other special purpose modules. And in a test environment, that's actually quite useful if you've got a bunch of signals coming in and you want to control those signals before they go back out again. So I bought this unit off of eBay. It's marked down as faulty, uh, no power and burning smell. And I haven't opened it up yet, but a quick look at the front here. It looks in good condition. The only thing I would notice is this power switch doesn't seem to do much at all so there's some kind of lock up there uh, on the switch contacts and then on the inside maybe so let's get it down on the workbench let's open it up and let's see what we've got inside <laughs> So it looks like it's got the CPU module and the power supply in the back already and I think it's removable. I'm not sure. Ah yes, I can't just unplug it completely. Down in there there's a couple of wires that probably go way off to the front panel switch. I should be able to remove this rear panel. There we go. And it's got a module in already. And this, this is what they look like. And in this case here it's a 44474A. And I think that's just a general purpose I.O. module. Yep, yeah, there's no relays on this one. So this is just a digital input output card. Not sure how many I.O. lines it's actually got on it, but it uh, looks in pretty good condition. So I'll put that to one side. And there we go. There's not much else to it other than that. What you've got is the brains of the unit here, the processor and this card here, and the power supply and a passive motherboard by the looks of it. And I can already smell, yep. Yeah. Oh yes, something's been getting hot or it's blowing on this power supply. It's definitely got that smell. And it just looks like it's an off-the-shelf power supply there, a switch mode power supply. Hopefully there's nothing wrong down on here. Uh, but we'll take that out anyway, lift the cover and have a look. Let's see if we can find some information on the power supply as well. Uh, yep, it's an Artisan power supply, an NFN40-7608. So let's unplug the AC input to this power supply and get the CPU module out. There we go. I'll put this to one side and I'm just going to lift the lid on this and take a little tweak inside and see what we've got. There we go. That's the cover off. I'm going to reposition the camera and we'll take a better look. So here's the CPU module. You can see the 240 volt IEC socket on the back there and that just comes in and actually goes, the wires from it actually go right underneath the PCB and just out the other end. They're not actually attached to this board at all. So this is going direct to the power supply. So a look at the actual chassis again, I was actually wrong. That power switch on the front panel of the unit actually interfaces to the passive back plane on the actual unit and from there it controls the power supply. There is no large uh, uh, multi-way contact switch like you often see in Agilent and HP uh, test instruments etc. So yeah this one works a little bit different. 
On the main board here, you've got a Xilinx Spartan FPGA. You've got a microprocessor here. Uh, you've got some RAM and ROM by the looks of it over here. And the GPIB section here. And a very familiar 74LS series buffer ICs for the uh, uh, GPIB. And a GPIB controller chip and a UART in order to talk to the rest of the system. So this one looks in pretty good nick. There's definitely no smell in and around here. So it looks like uh, that smell is from the power supply. It's that kind of smell anyway. You sort of recognize um, that it is power supply related. So I'll put the cover back on this unit just to protect it. And we'll take another look at the chassis again. So here's the power switch at this side here and it's just a PCB mounted switch on the back of the display board there. And that display board then just interfaces to the back plane via this ribbon cable that you can see here that just goes away underneath the power supply then up onto the back of the uh, motherboard there. Let's take a little look at that there and yeah that's the solder pins for it there. And you can actually see there are some semiconductors on the back of this motherboard here. That's obviously to do with the power supply switching to control the power. So it looks like the power supply has always got a mains connection just as long as the IEC plug is connected into the back of the unit. And it looks like probably the DC outputs which we've got here are then switched probably by those uh, semiconductors there on this back plane. Now there are some tantalum capacitors on this back plane but they look okay. Usually a telltale sign that a tantalum's gone or on its way out it will have like a dark brown patch or a spot on them. And these look okay but I will put the meter across them just to make sure that uh, any problem on the back plane wasn't the cause of any power supply fault if indeed there is one. So next thing, let's get the power supply out and onto the workbench. And here it is. And as I said earlier, it's an NFN 40-7608. Now I did take a quick look to see if I could find any schematics for this power supply, but I couldn't find anything. So we'll just have to wing it. I'm sure we'll be able to affect a repair. They're generally uh, quite simple power supplies, uh, albeit it's a switch mode power supplies. Uh, I'll go over everything on the board. I'll look at every component and inspect them. Let's see if there's any cracks on any resistors, any blown capacitors or leaky capacitors or any sign of damage at all. Certainly, first quick inspection, it looks okay front and back. And you can see the isolation gap here between the primary side on this side and the secondary side on this side. And nothing looks untoward there at all. There's generally not any signs of any overheating. There's maybe some slight discoloration round about here and perhaps all of this area here. Probably a sign that there'd been a little bit of uh, high temperatures there but nothing uh, drastic that would cause any big, big problem. Certainly not any blown tracks, that's for sure. So I'll go away, I'll go over the board, I'll uh, give it a real good inspection and let's see what I can find. Well, I went over most of the components on the power supply and nothing's jumping out at me. Let's take a little look at a block diagram. How does a switch mode power supply actually work? Okay, so here's the very, very basics of a switch mode power supply. So you've got your AC input coming in here, common mode choke, couple of filter capacitors, then that AC mains is rectified directly and that'll go directly on to one side of the primary side of this transformer here. The other side of that primary side is then connected to a MOSFET which is driven by a PWM driver IC. The secondary side of the transformer is rectified and that produces your DC output. However, in order to get a regulated output, that signal from the main output is then fed back into an error amplifier. Basically, that voltage is compared with a known reference voltage and any deviation higher or lower We'll then switch this optocoupler here, which is across the isolation barrier there, 
and into the PWM driver IC which will then control the gate. So if the output goes up too high then the PWM driver will get a signal to stop switching the main MOSFET and of course if the DC output starts going low then the PWM driver will turn on the MOSFET and it all happens pretty fast and therefore you get a regulated DC output. Now there's quite a lot more components especially on the secondary side of this power supply it's because it's a three rail power supply. One of the rails will be used as the primary DC rail for the feedback mechanism and I think this power supply is plus 5 volts and plus and minus 12 volts so it will usually be the 5 volt rail, the high current rail that's fed back across the opto isolator which is down here and down there is the PWM IC and that is a UC3842AN and that is a very common PWM IC used in switch mode power supplies so before we take a look at a diagram, let's have a look. There's your common mode choke, you've got a PTC or a MOV there, your fuse, you've got uh, the main filter capacitor there, and there is the bridge rectifier there, and a few other components on that primary side. And the big MOSFET, this is it here on this heatsink. And there is your mains transformer, isolation barrier right down there, right across that opto isolator there. And then you've got the secondary side on this side here. And buried down here, there's your reference, your TL431 in this case, which is part of that error amplifier circuit. So I've had a look over most of the components, the, the main components anyway, and I can't see any cracked resistors, any blown resistors. I've measured the uh, uh, MOSFETs and diodes, etc. right round the circuit on both sides, and everything seems quite reasonable measuring them in circuit anyway. Nothing looks bad at all. So taking a look at the data sheet for the UC3842, there's a nice typical application circuit at the back. And you can see the AC coming in here, the bridge rectifier, you've got the main UC3842 PWM IC there, the main MOSFET there, the main transformer there, the rectification on the secondary side of that uh, uh, output there, that'll be the main uh, typical output there and you can see it fed off from that output down into this part of the circuit here. In this particular case they've got a TL431, that's your reference and you've got the opto isolator here which is driving across onto the UC3842. Now if you take a look at this block diagram again you will see there is something missing. Now if you remember the output is determined by the PWM driver controlling the main MOSFET. Well how is it all going to do that at switch on, at power on? This PWM driver needs power as well. It needs a stable DC power supply in order to run. Now in some power supplies they'll just take a feed off the DC regulated input, the high voltage DC and have a dropper resistor down and onto the PWM driver. But I think in the case of our power supply they've done something a little bit different. So there's the main transformer there but you've got another secondary here on the primary side. You've got a rectifier diode, a series resistor and a large capacitor and that DC supply is fed down into pin 7 VCC of the UC3842A but that's not going to help start up the power supply. This is the important resistor here. This is your dropper resistor which will kick start the PWM here and then when it's up and running this secondary takes over and provides the voltage supply for the UC3842A. Okay I just decided to put the power supply back into the chassis. It was easy to do. So I've got the AC input just off camera there hooked into the other end of the power supply there. So if I just switch it on we've got the pinouts here on the data sheet for the actual power supply. The plus 12 then there's two plus 5.1s then two zero volts and then the minus 12 at the bottom there. So let's go let's put the power on and let's go down those terminals there and see what we've got. That's power on now, so nothing went bang. So we've got 
11.7 we've got 5 volts and down at the end here we've got minus 12 volts so it is actually working off load anyway but there may be a problem on load or possibly a problem with the uh, uh, power supply switching circuit on the actual uh, back plane there. As I mentioned at the start of this video, this is the DC output here that comes up this cable directly onto the back plane. Remembering there is a permanent AC input onto the power supply at all times. And it looks like the power switch on the front of the unit is actually probably switching the DC outputs. Maybe the plus 5 volts is switched uh, by uh, a couple of the uh, semiconductors on the actual backplane. So I've got power removed at the moment. What I think I will do now is just, just check the resistances across the DC power going onto this backplane. Let's see if we've got any dead shorts or anything. So here's the 5.1. Oh, that'll help. Yeah, that looks okay. And the plus 12. And that looks okay as well. And the minus 12 is not actually used. This is it here. So, yeah, it's just, they're just using two rails. How about between the plus 12 and the plus 5? Yeah, that looks okay. So what I think I'll do next is put this power connector down into the power supply and at least power up the back plane on its own. Okay, we've got power now, so let's just double check. Let's see if we've got five volts on here. Oh. Yeah, we've got smoke coming from that power supply. Something's gone on this back plane that must be drawing far too much current, I think. And it's causing a problem with this power supply. So I think what I will do is I've uh, disconnected the back plane, so I'm going to power it up again off load and let's double check that I haven't knackered the power supply. Okay, all ready for a power up, load disconnected. So this time I'm going to measure the DC outputs and I'm going to leave it on a little bit longer to make sure that uh, uh, we are getting a good output and there's no more smoke coming from that power supply off load. So first of all, the 5.1, and there we go, and yes, 5.08 of a volt, the plus 12, 11.7, and the minus 12, you know it's not used, minus 12 point, minus 12.06. So back to the 5.1 volt rail, that's looking good, no more smoke anyway. Okay, that's power off. So what do I think has gone wrong here? Well, I think the power supply is okay. I think the problem's on this backplane. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hook up the backplane to my bench power supply. All I need is plus 12 volts and plus 5.1. And I should be able to monitor the current then that this backplane's drawing to see if there's any problem. Now, I know it's not the CPU card because it's not actually plugged in. So let me hook up the bench power supply in place of this connector here and we'll take it for there. Now of course it could be the display board that's the problem because uh, like I said at the start of this video there is actually a connector on the back plane which goes away off the display. That could be the problem but like I said I'm not getting any low resistances across that connector there so I'm just going to feed in my plus 5 and plus 12 volts uh, in, with a, a constant current mode set and we'll see where we go from there. Well I just tested it off camera there and it's the plus 12 volt that's a problem. It's just drawn a lot of current as soon as I put uh, the power supply on. The 5 volt is basically drawing nothing and that's probably because the 5 volt goes to the main CPU board that goes in here and the plus 12 volt possibly that's used for the display. So next thing to do is disassemble the front panel and let's take a look at the display board. It. there we go so something on this display board is gone and drawing a lot of current 
Okay, we've got the display board off. Now, like I said, measuring across the 12 volt supply coming in, if that's the only supply coming in, it's not a very low resistance, so there's some other problem happening. And uh, a little bit of an inspection on the top side here. Somebody's been in here before. This uh, IDC connector here has been uh, resoldered and not a very good job there at all. But uh, looking under the uh, VFD, I can see some of the components there and look what I spied. Let me zoom in there. That is one burnt out tantalum capacitor. So it looks like I'm going to have to remove the VFD in order to get at that and find out exactly where it is in relation to the 12 volt supply. And uh, let's see what else we can find. Okay, so first things first, let's get the VFD off so that we can get access to the components underneath and let's see what we've got. Okay, I've ran the soldering iron along the edge connector here for the VFD and applied some fresh solder, i.e. some fresh flux and that should help with the desoldering gun. So, it should be warm enough now, let's get to it. Right, that's it desoldered and it's actually falling apart in my hands now. Coming away at one end. Ah, there we go. And that's the VFD off. All the pins are intact. I'm just hoping that VFD is good. So let's get our first look now at the board. And yes, that tantalum capacitor is gone. And looking around the rest of the board, I'm not really seeing anything else. So let's take a look at the schematic. I haven't looked at the schematics for this uh, instrument yet. So let's take a look at the schematic for the display board and see what sort of power supply arrangement we have got. Okay, there is actually a couple of sheets for the display board. And here's the connector going down onto the back plane. And as you can see, we've got 12 volts coming in here. And there is the power on standby switches are calling it. And over here, we've got five volts coming up from the back plane as well. That's obviously coming from that main power supply along with that 12 volts. Now, the capacitor that's gone is clearly marked C216. And that's down on this page of the schematic. And there it is there, C216 in parallel with a whole load other tantalum capacitors. And that's on the boost converter, you've got 12 volts coming into this LT1170, it's a switching regulator and it's producing via this MOSFET here a 36 volt supply. And that's probably for the VFD without looking. So we need to uh, have a look around this area here and let's, let's see, um, other than that uh, tantalum that's blown, what else is gone? Now you may be asking, why didn't I measure a low resistance across that 12 volt supply when I was troubleshooting earlier on? Despite there being an obvious short, dead short on that tantalum. And that's because there is a regulator in the way. And uh, obviously I was measuring the supply resistance across the 12 volt supply, which is the input to that LT1170. Not knowing there was a short or a large current draw on the output from that LT1170. So I'm actually glad in a way that it's a 36 volt rail that's failed. Um, because I would hate for it to be the 5 volt rail that had failed because that had, would have more chance of burning out these uh, microcontroller and logic ICs on the display board itself. So if there's any of the supplies I wanted to fail, I think it would be the 36 volt. So let's go and measure across those capacitors there. Let's see what sort of resistance we're getting. Then we'll remove that tantalum and then see what we've got after that. Now just as a precaution, I won't just be replacing C216, I'll be replacing all the capacitors. But let's take a look at the board first and see what we've got. Right, 
straight across C216. Let's see what we've got. Five, six ohms. Wow. And uh, presuming this is the rest of the capacitors here. Yeah. Just over five ohms. So let's uh, get rid of that capacitor there. And let's just take a look and see what we've got after that. Wow. What a smell. It's been a while since I've smelt a burnt out tantalum. There we go. And the board does need a bit of a clean up, that's for sure. Okay. Cross that capacitor again. Ah, it's better. 30k. And across the pads of that one I just removed. 30k. I think we're safe to go ahead and replace all five of those tantalum capacitors. And they're all the same, they're 4.7 microfarad, 50 volt. I should have something. Now there is actually a tantalum over here, we'll take a look at some of the other tantalums etc on the board, but uh, first things first, let's get those changed out. Right, that's all five capacitors removed, so let's clean up the PCB. Don't want any carbon deposits left behind because that can be ever so slightly conductive and could cause further issues. So, yeah, I think that's come out quite good. Uh, as luck would have it, I don't have any suitable replacement tantalum capacitors. So I'm actually going to go ahead and fit four of these 10 microfarad 50 volt aluminium electrolytic capacitors which should do the job and uh, it's uh, not far off the uh, total capacitance value of the five original tantalum capacitors so I think that should do the trick so let's get them in place they should fit in the existing footprint let's get them soldered in now I'm offsetting them very slightly because there is actually a track underneath an Avia and I don't want to short out because the capacitors, the legs from them actually run towards the centre of the capacitor. So I just want to make sure that there's no chance of a short. Right, let's double check I've not got any shorts. And yep. Yeah. Perfect. Next one I'm going to replace C204. That's on the 12 volt input directly from the actual connector. So that's the incoming 12 volt supply. So I'm just going to change that one out. It's a 10 microfarad, 35 volt. And I've also changed the capacitor, the tantalum capacitor across the 5 volt supply coming in. Another uh, aluminium el electrolytic and I hope I've got the height available because it's this one's quite a lot taller than the tantalum was but it's below the height of the switch there which I think just goes up against the panel so hopefully that will fit in. If it doesn't I'll have to change it out later on. So the next thing I'm going to do I'm going to hook up the bench power supply feed in 5 and 12 volts and let's see if we've got 36 volts and uh, no high currents. Uh, but first of all I'll re-solder that uh, connector there with the dodgy soldering and uh, take it for there. Okay it's a bench power supply set up 5 volts on channel 1, 12 volts on channel 2, common ground. Let's see what happens. And I've basically wired up across those input capacitors for the 5 and 12 volt supply. And let's see what we've got now. I've set a current limit at 300 milliamps on both channels. Let's see what happens. Yep, 8 milliamps on the 5 volt rail, 33 milliamps on that 12 volt rail. Looking good so far. 
but do we actually have a 36 volt and do we have a processor that's running? Well, it's easy to check 36 volts, so there's my common 0 volts there. And Q202 is a MOSFET, that's feeding that 36 volts. So let's see what we've got. Not sure what pin I should be on. Wow, look at that. 37 volts on the multimeter. Perfect. Next thing I'm going to do, I'm going to actually hook up the scope. They very nicely labelled the processor with MCU across it. So obviously that's the microcontroller unit. So let's just randomly check a few of the pins and let's see if we've got any sorts of uh, switching, uh, logic switching there on some of the pins. We should have something. Okay, so the board's still powered up. So just off camera here, I'm just going to go along a row of pins on that MCU and let's see if we've got anything. Wow, that first pin. Look at that. We've definitely got something, some nice 5 volt logic there. And a couple of other pins just at random. Yeah, definitely got some action there. Well, I think we can bite the bullet now and actually refit the VFD and let's take it from there. Of course there is a bunch of other logic etc but without pouring over the schematic not entirely sure what it's for um, but I have got 5 volts okay I've got 12 volts okay I do have some sort of a microcontroller action so let's go ahead and refit the VFD. I'm just going to work my way along as best as I can can't put too much pressure on those pins at all. And there we are. Well, as I was concerned about, this end capacitor just gets touched by the glass. And the glass has got about another millimetre to drop, so I'm going to have to change out that capacitor. Either that or I can offset it slightly, it's only just caught by the glass. So if I just shift the capacitor towards the edge of the PCB very slightly, I should be good to go, I think. Okay, I think we're ready for a power-up. Now we're not going to fit it all back together, I should be able to power it up on the workbench here. I've got the ribbon cable coming from the back plane, plugged into the back of the display board. Power supply. That's that hooked up. And I will need to plug in the CPU board. Uh, I haven't actually tried this yet, so as far as I know it runs off of 5 volts, so we should be okay. So I can slot that in so that I can get to power to this connector here and through to the power supply. Yep, we've got 5 volts. Yes! And we've got something on the display. Let me just check the 12 volts. So the power's off again. And power on. Yes, 11.8 volts. And and the rotary encoder is working as well. So let's try this power switch. I'm not really sure what it does. It's a standby switch. It doesn't seem to be doing anything. It's slightly changing the DC voltage there. 11.7 and I press it in. Or out. 11.79. Not really sure what it's doing. Have we got a fault? Right, we're getting somewhere now. This is a schematic for the power on circuit. It consists of two FETs and the, a few resistors and they're mounted on the passive back plane. So you've got the power switch there on the front panel which I've drawn on. It's normally open and it's grounded. And you've got a signal here, plus 12 volts control. These two here, the plus 12 volts coming in, the plus 5 volts coming in, those are direct from the power supply. The plus 12 at this side and the plus 5 at that side is what goes off to the CPU board, etc. So, with the switch in the open position, this line is basically floating, but this resistor here pulls the gate towards the source, therefore, 
the FET is turned off. It's a P-type FET. So therefore, you get 0 volts on that plus 12 volt rail. And because you've got 0 volts there, the gate of this N-type FET is low. Therefore, that FET is off also. Therefore, no plus 5 volts. When you depress the switch, and it's a latching switch, the you get a grounded plus 12 volts control therefore it, this resistor here pulls the gate low therefore the FET turns on like I said it's a p-type FET and therefore you get 12 volts at the drain which goes away off to the rest of the instrument with this at 12 volts the gate is high there therefore this end type FET is turned on therefore you get 5 volts right through onto the source of that FET and you get 5 volts there as well so because I wasn't getting anything changing when I depressed that switch I can only assume the P type FET's gone now I have actually checked the switch uh, we'll try that again right now and we'll see if I can't troubleshoot what's going wrong here so power is off at the moment so if I go on to R102 that is uh, in series with the switch there and I've got the display board hooked up and you can see the, the switch is in the on position I will just turn it off we get about 470 ohms there and I'll push it in again latch it in and it's grounded zero volts so the switch is okay all the way back all the way into R102 which goes on to the gate of that uh, p-type FET okay I just got thrown there for a second off camera there's a couple of resistors as I mentioned and uh, R103 here and R101 down there are labeled wrongly on this schematic so that kind of threw me for a second so let's go on to the this P type FET here power still off that bottom pins the gate and then you've got the source and the drain there so if I measure across the source and the drain here we go 0.18 of an ohm no wonder that uh, FET is on all the time and when that FET's on all the time that's a P type FET that's basically feeding the end type FET and turning it on permanently provided this FET's okay as well so let me just go down onto this one I'm not sure what the pin out of this one is yeah but we've got no pins dead short anyway 3k and then basically open circuit on the other one so I think the end type FET's okay I think this P type FET is damaged so let me see if I can find a P type FET from a stock that can replace that one there well I don't have a suitable MOSFET that package it's a D-Pack package but I've got a TU220 package uh, that'll just about do the job so I'm going to hack that in temporarily and then I'll order up something new uh, once I know this is the only part that I need well there it is <laughs> TU220 package replacing a D-Pack and uh, rather nicely uh, the pins line up rather logically including keeping this tab away from the PCB so it's got the plastic side against uh, the screw and uh, some other components etc so it's looking rather lucky and I think um, if I'm plugging in any cards I think they should just about clear this TO220 but I'll just avoid this slot here for the plug-in card until I get that uh, MOSFET properly replaced with the right package but anyway I'm jumping ahead here let's uh, power it up and see what happens right all ready for a power up CPU cards in power supplies hooked up front panels hooked up so let me just put power on at the back and that's promising no life on the display yet let's press the power button yes yes we've got power and let's try turning it off perfect so yes that p-type MOSFET was indeed gone 
So what's next? Well actually I'm going to leave it switched on for a few minutes because there is no heat sink on that TO220 package so I just want to make sure that it doesn't get too hot or anything like that because it is passing the 12 volt rail. Now where the 12 volt rail goes in terms of the rest of the system and with uh, additional cards plugged in I don't know the total load on that 12 volt rail. So it is quite important I do get the correct MOSFET or something compatible uh, fitted. But for the time being, let's just leave it on for you know 10, 15 minutes. I'll come back and we'll uh, I'll uh, check the temperature on that MOSFET. Okay, it's been on about 15 minutes, and actually the MOSFET's stone cold. So I think all it's doing right now is powering the display, and uh, maybe whatever else is required inside the uh, CPU module which I don't think will be much given it's uh, uh, just the CPU it's probably mostly the 5 volt so I think I'll bolt it back together for the moment it's easy to replace that uh, MOSFET it's just a case of sliding off the cover so I'll go away and put it back together and I'll come back well there we go another instrument for the workshop I do actually have some plans for this instrument to try and switch some metrology grade signals in and out and uh, that might actually mean modifying uh, one of the relay cards perhaps uh, uh, putting in uh, some better relays onto it but anyway that's maybe for a future video um, so we're 99.9% .9 repaired on this just that MOSFET to uh, replace which will just take a five minute job really but uh, yep yeah. I'll find a space for this in the workshop and uh, hopefully have fun with it later on. Thanks for watching.